There is a widely shared sense in the West today that the days are darkening. Perhaps they are, perhaps it's the sense we have and it's not well founded, but it seems that Christians have lost or are rapidly losing whatever cultural influence and favor they once enjoyed and are less and less tolerated year by year from the world around us. And that makes the theme of our conference, Suffering and the Sovereignty of God, all the more relevant to our lives and to our ministries today. Many Christians in the West are rediscovering, as it were, that suffering in the forms that we now appear to be facing or are already facing brings its own kind of temptation, its own set of temptations. And that raises a question, a question that I think our text, 2 Timothy 4, 9 through 18, helps us to think through. And that is, what is required of a faithful witness to Jesus Christ in the midst of suffering? Let's give attention now to the reading of the Word of God. 2 Timothy chapter 4 beginning with verse 9 and reading through verse 18. Do thy diligence to come shortly unto me. For Demas hath forsaken me, having loved this present world, and is departed unto Thessalonica, Crescens to Galatia, Titus unto Dalmatia. Only Luke is with me. Take Mark and bring him with thee for he is profitable to me for the ministry. Antichicus have I sent to Ephesus. The cloak that I left at Troas with Carpus, when thou comest, bring with thee, and the books, but especially the parchments. Alexander the coppersmith did me much evil. The Lord reward him according to his works. Of whom be thou where also, For he hath greatly withstood our words. At my first answer, no man stood with me, but all men forsook me. I pray God that it may not be laid to their charge. Notwithstanding, the Lord stood with me and strengthened me, that by me the preaching might be fully known, and that all the Gentiles might hear. And I was delivered out of the mouth of the lion. And the Lord shall deliver me from every evil work and will preserve me unto his heavenly kingdom, to whom be glory forever and ever. Amen. Let's pray. O Lord our God, we thank you for this word. We thank you for this text. We thank you for the ministry of the Apostle Paul who is worthy of imitation insofar as he was an imitation of the Lord Jesus Christ. We see much of Christ in him in this passage. We pray that you would open our eyes to see Christ as we think about this together and its application to our context, to ourselves, to our own hearts, and to our own minds. Spirit, we ask that you would work among us and do that which only you can do. We ask it in the name of Christ and to the praise of his glory. Amen. What is required of a faithful witness? A witness, in the sense that I mean it here, is someone who has been entrusted with with news, with a message of some sort. A proclamation, a, a word, a logos, as Paul puts it in verse 15. They may be an eyewitness to something that must be told. We have a wonderful and somewhat humorous example of this in the Old Testament, for example, when four lepers outside Samaria, when it was under the siege of Ben-Hadad, at a time when dove's dung was trading for silver and women were resorting to eating their own children decided there was nothing better for them to do than to go over to the camp of the Syrian army. And they did at the evening, and when they got there, they found that it was deserted. 
that the Syrians had abandoned everything and it was all there for the taking. And, and what they did begin to take with them was strewn all along the roadside on the way. And that's what they began to do. They began to take it. They ate and drank their fill. Then they began to hoard. And then their conscience struck them. And they said to one another, we are not doing right. This is a day of good news. If we are silent and wait until the morning light, punishment will overtake us. Now, therefore, let us get up and go and tell the king's house. And they did. And that day, you could buy five bushels of flour for what a quart of dove's dung cost the day before. Sometimes you stumble onto news so important, so significant, that you must proclaim it. That your conscience will not let you get away with anything less than proclaiming it. Other times, people are told and shown things of this magnitude. But the effect is just the same, isn't it? It can morally obligate us to make the thing known, to sound the warning, to share the good news, or to warn people of the bad news. Whatever the case may be, what, whatever it is that we've come upon, and whether we wanted it or not, whether we asked to be in this position or not, we sometimes find that we've been made a watchman either by God's providence or by his call. And so it was for Ezekiel. And so it was for the rest of the prophets. And so it is for the apostles too. They had been shown things. They had been told things. They had been entrusted with a word, a message, news of such magnitude that it must be proclaimed. There was no other option. It was news of such significance and such scope that it must be proclaimed to the ends of the earth, to everyone, everywhere. The apostles were eyewitnesses to all that Jesus had said and done. And though they came to this office like the begging lepers outside of Samaria, they did not just stumble upon a surprising scene. They were called. And they were trained, and they were prepared for this very purpose. Their mission centered on being an eyewitness, a faithful witness to Jesus Christ. Indeed, this is the basic qualification of the office itself. Judas, you will remember, had been an eyewitness of Christ's earthly ministry, but he betrayed Christ for 30 pieces of silver. And they went off and hung himself on a tree, dying under the curse of the law just like Christ, but by his own hands and for his own sin, not for the sins of others and their salvation. And in this way, Judas is a kind of antichrist. His way is the way of ruin and desolation. He was not a martyr for Christ's sake. He was not a faithful witness. And his apostasy left a hole in the ranks of the disciples. And the eleven were aware of this, and they, they searched the scriptures to learn what to do, just as they should, and they came to the conclusion that they must appoint someone else to take Judas's place, and that's what they did. And here's how they explained themselves and, and the qualification, what it was that they were looking for and the one to join them. The man must be one of the men who accompanied us during all the time that the Lord Jesus went in and out among us, beginning from the baptism of John until the day he was taken up from us. One of these men must become with us a witness to his resurrection. And there were two candidates, and the lot fell to Matthias, and he was counted with the eleven apostles. They wanted an eyewitness to join them in their apostleship to become a faithful witness alongside them, to testify with them to the great and saving work of God in Jesus Christ. And notice the decisive word or message, the good news, that they are to proclaim to the ends of the earth. The one thing that sums up everything that they had to say 
from the baptism of John to the to Christ's ascension, the one thing that Judas did not witness and could not testify to, his resurrection. Thousands, tens of thousands of people had been crucified. In worldly terms, many good men among them. Crosses were common enough in the Roman Empire and for some of the empires that preceded them. And they were designed, as you well know, as we even were reminded of earlier this morning, as instruments of brutality. Indeed, to be public spectacles of brutality. They were used to terrorize a conquered people into submission. And sadly, therefore, the Greco-Roman world was filled with eyewitnesses to crucifixions, perhaps hundreds of eyewitnesses for each crucified person. But of those tens of thousands who were crucified, only one of them had the audacity to claim that he would rise again on the third day. And even if there was someone somewhere, which I don't think there was, who did make such a claim, only one person ever made good on it, Jesus Christ. And only one person ever has, the Lord of glory himself. The resurrection is God's word to the world, God's word concerning his son, concerning the perfection of his work on behalf of his people on the cross, concerning his identity, concerning the veracity of everything that he claimed to be and presented himself to be, and everything he taught and taught and told us of. The resurrection is God's word to the world. News of far, far greater goodness, we might say, than, than the lifting of the siege of Samaria and of far greater significance than the fall of Jerusalem that Ezekiel had to trumpet. Here is the Son of God, one with the Father and the Spirit, God of God, light of light, very God of very God, who for us and our salvation assumed our created nature and took on the form of a servant and became obedient to the law, obedient to the point of death, even on a cross. He suffered and was condemned by church and state alike and was crucified, died, and buried. And on the third day, he rose again, according to the scriptures. And he ascended into heaven where he sits at the right hand, of majesty on high, reigning as King of kings and Lord of lords. On this, on Christ's exaltation, Judas had nothing to say. He testified to Christ's innocence. I have sinned by betraying innocent blood, he confessed. But he was not an eyewitness of the resurrection. He had no testimony of this or the ascension, He did not know he was the Lord of glory, and he was dead and gone before the outpouring of the Spirit. Of all of this, he had nothing to say. He had disqualified himself through his unbelief and betrayal. An apostle is of necessity an eyewitness to the resurrection. The resurrection of the obedient and the crucified Son of God. The resurrection of the Lord of glory now ascended, seated at the right hand of majesty on high, willing and able to save everyone who calls on him in faith. Having already made a purification for sins on behalf of all that the Father had entrusted to him to be redeemed by him. Ready to pour out his spirit on his own as the fulfillment of the promise made to Abraham long ago and the sign that he indeed reigns and is building his church on earth and that nothing will be able to prevail against him. He is the worthy one, worthy of our worship together with the Father and the Spirit, worthy of all praise and glory and honor forever and ever. This is the word of God to the world. The message, the news entrusted to the apostles as faithful witnesses to these things. And here is Paul. 
Maybe you forgot that I was in Paul. (laughs) Here is Paul, who is not with the disciples through the Lord's earthly ministry, from the baptism of John up through his death on the cross. He was not, as far as we know, an eyewitness to the miracles. He was not in attendance at the teaching of the parables. But he was an eyewitness to his exaltation, to his resurrection and ascension, and to his present reign on high, and to Christ's ability to save his own, however near or however far they may be from him, however hardened and resentful they may be in their own unbelief. Though last of all, he writes the Corinthians, as one untimely born, he appeared also to me, the least of all the apostles, unworthy to be called an apostle. A persecutor of the church, of Christ himself, the Lord insists, who by the grace of God outworked all the others. Judge for yourself whether Paul is the least or the greatest. Jesus had some things to say about debates like those, didn't he? And it's kind of a silly argument anyway, isn't it? Because what counts is not how great we may seem in our own eyes, but but how faithful we are in his eyes. Faithfulness is enough. In a sense, faithfulness is everything. It's certainly what the Lord asks of those who love him. Simple faithfulness. Paul was a faithful witness to the Lord Jesus Christ. And we are called to be the same, particularly those of us who hold office within his church, who've been ordained into this ministry. We must recognize the word entrusted to us, its magnificence and its significance, and proclaim it to everyone, everywhere, even if only you have just a minute in an elevator in a hospital. (laughs) as Dr. Beeky reminded us this morning. And particularly, we must think about it this way. Everyone, everywhere, all the time, wherever we are, when it seems convenient to us, in season, entirely pleasant to do so, and when it seems like death sentence to us to do so. What is the Christian parent's greatest responsibility? To teach their children to trust the one true living God. Enrich your family devotions from the Family Worship Bible Guide. This precious book offers rich devotional thoughts for children of all ages on every chapter in the Bible. To learn more about the Family Worship Bible Guide, visit heritagebooks.org. that we might be able to say with Paul at the end of it all, that through me, the proclamation entrusted to us, the message, the good news, the kerygma, the word that Paul uses here, might be fully proclaimed. There is no doubt that Paul is not, in a worldly sense at any rate, in a convenient place to preach Christ to fully proclaim the gospel entrusted to him. His life is on the line. It's clear. No doubt for doing the very thing throughout the world that he's now called to do before Caesar's court. Possibly, depending on how you read 2 Timothy and whether Paul's imprisoned once or twice and so on, possibly after being told to knock it off by this very court. And here he is, Again, whatever the case, Paul was no stranger to danger. We know that. He'd been stoned and left for dead at Lystra on his first missionary venture. He had wanted to preach to the rioting horde in Ephesus. Even here in this passage, he warns Timothy about Alexander the coppersmith who did him great harm. Paul was used to preaching the gospel in seasons of suffering. Everyone who lives for Christ in this world will be persecuted. 
we will all be hated and despised and rejected and even betrayed, perhaps. And it stings and it cuts deep and the pain can linger. And if we are not careful with it, it can fester and it can be intensified greatly through all the abuse that follows in its wake that comes along with it because we are hated and despised and so on. Suffering is the way of the pilgrim of faith in this fallen world. We endure the world. We put up with the world. We survive the world, at least for a season. We are regarded as sheep to be slaughtered by the world. So the world hated Christ, so the world hates us, so be it. Christ has overcome the world. Here Paul, apostle to the Gentiles, is imprisoned. He's been imprisoned before, possibly in Rome, certainly elsewhere. He is now, after his first hearing, his first defense, clearly expecting to be executed. I am being poured out as a drink offering, he writes Timothy, and the time of my departure has come. I have fought the good fight. I have finished the race. I have kept the faith. Paul remind, Paul's mind and heart, we see, is, is moving ahead. His days of ministry on earth are coming to a close. He's about to exchange his cross for a crown, the crown of righteousness, he calls it, which the Lord himself will award to me. But he has not departed yet, has he? And as long as he is still this side of the Jordan, there is work to do. There is ministry before him. There is a testimony that he must continue to bear to the world the message of good news entrusted to him that he must proclaim, and that if he fails to proclaim, he has failed to fulfill his ministry, he has failed to be obedient to his Lord, he has failed to do what he is called to do, what he is still here on earth to do. How easy it is to lose sight of our work in the midst of suffering, to be turned inward, and preoccupied with ourselves, to check out and to leave and to live in the fantasy of what could be or even perhaps what shall be. Paul is holding fast to his hope. There's no doubt about that. He's filled more and more with the glorious prospect of what awaits him. But he has not checked out like so many escapists in our time. Even in the Christian community, I say, drowning himself in soul numbing diversions, walling away the time as he waits for God's deliverance. No, he's fully engaged in the work at hand, in what is he is able to do in his present circumstances at this moment, what he has the opportunity to do right here, right now. Suffering is no impediment to faithfulness. It's no excuse for unfaithfulness either, is it? Imprisonment has, has never paralyzed Paul. He is able to be what he has been called to be, even when he is in chains, a faithful witness, whatever the circumstances of his life. Indeed, it is precisely in those circumstances that we are enabled to be faithful witnesses and to fulfill our ministries. Think about it. How else does someone like Paul get an audience with governors and kings and even emperors except in chains? Brothers and sisters, there is a kind of witness to Christ to his worthiness and his trustworthiness that shines most brilliantly in our faithful suffering. Paul has work to do. And he wants Timothy to come soon. And he wants him to bring Mark. And he wants his cloak. He might live into the winter. And he wants his books. And above all, his parchments. 
It's tempting to speculate on all of that, but we dare not. But what is clear is that Paul wants to be and is determined to be productive. To press on through his suffering and his imprisonment and his chains. He wants to be useful. Paul himself is the one who reminds us how useless we are once were dead in our trespasses and sins. And invites us to marvel over how useful we become through the grace of God in Jesus Christ. He remembers well that he was once an enemy of Christ and of his people. He knows he has been forgiven much and it shows in how much he loves God and is willing to be poured out in the service of others to the glory of his God. Grace does not lead us to withdraw into idleness. It does not lead us to pull back from the world, to stew in bitterness or resentment for how they think of us or treat us. Grace does not lead us into idleness and withdraw, but to lean into the deeper joy of being useful in Christ's service. Useful to God and useful to others. Useful as a faithful witness to the reality of saving grace in Jesus Christ. In the grip of God's grace, this is what Paul has been doing ever since his conversion. And his eyes were opened in Damascus, and he became useful in Christ's service. It's the only thing he knows to do. And it's the only thing he seems to want to do with his time that is left to him in this world, which is dwindling fast and soon to end. But this is not something he's doing just in anxiety here at the very end. This is what has marked him and defined him all along the way. Do you remember Paul's conversion? Yes, of course you do. And how he was first struck blind and had to be led by the hand. How Christ made him feel his uselessness. That all of his zealous working on which he was depending was exposed as nothing but enmity toward God to his great life-shattering surprise. And do you remember how God commanded Ananias to go to Paul and restore his sight? And how surprised Ananias was by this command, having heard about Paul and his terrible persecution of the saints. And you remember what the Lord told Ananias. How he assured him, saying, Go, for he is a chosen instrument of mine to carry my name before the Gentiles and kings and the children of Israel. For I will show him how much he must suffer for the sake of my name. And here he is at the end of his days, writing to one of his closest companions in the work of the ministry, suffering for the sake of Christ's name, imprisoned, abandoned in the clutch of the lion's mouth. What is this lion's mouth he speaks of? We may well hear an echo of Daniel here and of the persecution that he had to endure when he passed that long night in a den full of half-starved lions. But Paul is not in the mouth of a literal lion, of course. We know that. It's a metaphor. And it's the metaphor of Psalm 22. Sound familiar? The psalm cited by our Lord from the cross. Where David says his enemies open wide their mouths at me like a ravening and roaring lion. And again he prays, but you, O Lord, do not be far off. O you, my help, come quickly to my aid. Deliver my soul from the sword. Save me from the mouth of the lion. Peter, of course, describes Satan in these terms. Your adversary, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion, seeking someone to devour. And Paul, surely thinking of his adversary and ours, 
as he in his own lived experience here goes down into that same place where David was when he was writing Psalm 22 and where our Lord went as he hung there dying on the cross. An adversary far wiser and more sinister than Nero, whoever he was standing before, who understands the spiritual dynamics of this life and skillfully and subtly exploits them to his own evil schemes. Satan wields the power of death, the author of Hebrews reminds us. And through the fear of death, he enslaves sinners all of their lives driving them from one dead work to another as they vainly attempt to bury their sense of guilt so deeply, hardening their hearts and searing their consciences that it would no longer stir and trouble them anymore. Or perhaps they may try to pacify their conscience by good works imperfectly rendered or by empty ceremonies incapable of doing the job. Or most likely, they're pursuing some combination of all of these things, wasting their lives in futility. Useless. Dead people doing dead works that cannot save themselves or anyone else. Satan does not seem to care how he gets you to sin or what particular sin you commit, at least ordinarily, it seems. His goal, it seems, is just to get you to sin one way or the other so he can sink his teeth into your flesh and take a hold of you in his jaws. This is the lion's mouth, the temptation. The temptation, not even Satan, but the temptation that comes to us amid our suffering. A temptation rooted in the fear of death, a temptation to despair of the sufficiency of Christ for us in that moment. To answer the question, can I trust Christ now with a no? A temptation to balk at obedience. A temptation to buy our life at the cost of betraying Christ. Look at Paul's thinking here in our passage. The lion's mouth is not suffering in itself. Suffering is the occasion of falling into the lion's mouth, but it is not the lion's mouth. Paul has, for the moment, by his own admission, confession, and praise, been rescued from the lion's mouth, and yet he is still in chains. He is still under arrest, and he is still very much facing death. The lion's mouth is not even death itself. Paul is confident that he will be delivered from the lion's mouth, and at the same time, he is sure He will soon be put to death. These two realities, his being rescued from the lion's mouth and his being put to death by Caesar's sword, are not mutually exclusive in his mind. He's not talking about being rescued from death. On the contrary, death is about to overtake him, and so is the Lord's deliverance. The deliverance Paul awaits and writes of here to Timothy is not a deliverance from death but a deliverance from the temptation to fear death, from the temptation to resort to crafty schemes, to escape or to find relief from his present sufferings. And this deliverance may well come through death, as Paul presently anticipates. Do you see this in our text? So I was rescued from the lion's mouth, he says. And the Lord will rescue me from every evil deed and bring me safely into his heavenly kingdom. The deliverance that Paul awaits is not from death, but from the evil deed, every evil deed. And that will ultimately come our way. Would you like to deepen your understanding of Reformed theology? Check out Reformed Systematic Theology, Volume 4, Church and Last Things, by Dr. Joel Beakey and Paul Smalley to explore key scripture topics from biblical, doctrinal, experiential, and practical perspectives. Pre-order the culmination of Dr. Beakey's life's work at Heritage Books dot o-r-g forward slash 
RST4. And he will be delivered. He will be brought through. And he will be brought safely into Christ's heavenly kingdom. So what is the lion's mouth if it is not suffering or death? What are these teeth that Paul feels digging into his flesh as he stood before Caesar's court abandoned by men? Yet confident with a kind of hope against hope that the Lord would deliver him even if it will be through death rather than from death. It is evil itself. And specifically in this moment and on this occasion, the temptation to balk before this court, to fail to fully proclaim Christ so that all the Gentiles may hear. Paul has been rescued not from suffering or death, but from faltering before Jordan's stormy banks, from despairing in the face of evil threats and death itself, even as he could feel the lion's breath on his neck. Look, this is a common temptation. They all are. And this is a common temptation to pilgrims of faith. We walk after all in the valley of the shadow of death and evil seems to lurk along our way all of our days. Abraham succumbed to this temptation more than once. Surely you remember when he was afraid for his own life that they might kill him so that they could have Sarah and he resorted to his own sort of duplicitous path in his attempt to save himself by trying to pass her off as merely his sister. And David, too, when he finally despaired of hiding from Saul in the wilderness and and thought there was nothing better for him to do than to flee to Philistia, turned down his own duplicitous path for a season. But God did not let them go their own way forever. And we see renewed in each the same faith we see in Daniel who stood before Darius and did not break before the prospect of the lion's den. And of his three friends who were bold before Nebuchadnezzar and testified to God's saving power, these are faithful witnesses. And when there there is Jesus Christ himself, who knows what it is to be abandoned and betrayed, to be condemned to agonize over the cup he had to drink and sweat as it were drops of blood in prayer. The shadow of the cross reached all the way to Bethlehem as the lion pursued him even in his infancy. The temptation to balk before the horror of the cross was was ever present throughout his earthly ministry, it seems. The leading edge of Satan's temptations in the wilderness and found even in the admonition of Peter, his friend. He is able to help us in our time of need. He has suffered as we suffer. He has suffered suffering's temptation. He is a faithful high priest. And here is Paul sharing Christ's sufferings and becoming like him in his death knowing him and the power of his resurrection at new depths as Caesar's sword hangs precariously over his head and the roaring lion is ready to devour him. He feels the temptation to balk keenly. But the faithful one stands with him, strengthening him, just as he promised to do. Though Christ was abandoned by all, he never abandons his own. He gives Paul the grace he needs in the moment of need to entrust himself wholly to the Lord and fully proclaim the gospel to all the Gentiles. And look, he's doing this, yes, obviously with his words, but look at his life. His life is a proclamation of the Christ 
He's praying here for the forgiveness of those who have abandoned and betrayed him. He's fulfilling his ministry in the face of great suffering and by way of that suffering. And he is proclaiming God's saving grace. Telling of his mighty works in Jesus Christ. Even as he stands before judges, kings, emperors. This is what it takes to be a faithful witness. Faithful when you've been betrayed and seem abandoned. Faithful when you appear to be alone and on trial. Faithful when your freedom or even your very life is on the line. The temptation is to balk, to pull back, to doubt Christ, to fear for your life. To love your life more than Christ. To despair of the Lord's salvation. To resort to your own cunning and scheming ways. To sell out the Lord of glory. For your 30 pieces of silver. But by the Lord's steadfast love. Paul stood. Paul stands. He stands before Caesar's court. And he does not try to save himself by turning down some duplicitous path or by telling the court something calculated to spare his life that would involve denying his Savior or failing to fulfill his ministry and preach Christ in that moment on that occasion to that audience. No, he recognizes the apologetic moment for what it is the opportunity to fulfill his calling and ministry, to honor the Lord, to glorify his Lord, to preach Christ to all the Gentiles, which surely here means to the emperor, at least his court. This is exactly the kind of apologetic moment that Peter envisions that disciples of Christ will find themselves where he urges us to always be prepared. Paul is hauled before this court and commanded to give a reason for the hope that is within him. Not in so many words, to be sure. But it's the question. It is that question and no other question just the same. And he does not miss his opportunity to do that very thing. Though it will cost him his life. He preached Christ to them, just as he has throughout the world. Christ crucified for our sins, risen from the dead, ascended and reigning on high today. Paul was prepared precisely because he honored Christ the Lord as holy in his heart, as always faithful and true to his promises, and more to be desired than life itself. So he had no overpowering fear of them. I say that with a bit of care. He may have had some fear of them, but that fear did not overpower him. There were greater and deeper things at work within him. The Lord himself was at work within him and through him. And so he had no overpowering fear of them. Though they held the power of the sword, though he felt the temptation of suffering keenly, his conscience was clear. And most of all, he knew who stood with him in both his legal and his spiritual trial. And he had an advocate who was greater than his adversary, whose steadfast love and faithfulness He had proved over and over again in his life he was prepared. Whose righteousness and salvation he was ready to proclaim. The Lord strengthened Paul so that he did not falter. And he stood. He stood before Caesar's court as Christ's chosen instrument. Chosen for this very purpose. To be a faithful witness to all the Gentiles. So that through me, he writes, the message might be fully proclaimed and all the Gentiles might hear it. Do you hear the passive voice there? 
so that through me this might happen. Paul sees himself as a chosen instrument, as an instrument of the Lord himself. And he gives all praise and glory to the Lord. All honor belongs to him. He is the one that enabled him to stand. He is the one who enabled him to proclaim. Indeed, it was Christ himself who was doing these things through Paul, his instrument. As the risen and the ascended Lord is building his church on earth, nothing can prevent him. Nothing can prevail against him. And what was the payout for Paul, for his faithfulness, for trading his life that he might preach Christ to those who are ready to execute him? We don't know for sure, but there's certainly no indication anyone in that court was converted. And there's every indication that Paul himself went on to be executed. In the eyes of the world, Paul's daring, his courage, his boldness for Christ is easily dismissed as folly. A waste. What a waste of a life. What a, he had so much to offer. Look at all of his talents. Look at what he could have been. Look at what he had done all this. There was more yet. He seems to have done the very opposite of what any earthly counselor would have advised him to do in that moment. But in his faithfulness, we see Christ, don't we? And this is precious. It's precious to us. It is a witness to us and an encouragement to us. But it's also precious to Paul. Very precious to Paul. Look at his deep and seemingly unshakable sense of assurance that is the fruit of this. I was rescued, he writes, and the Lord will rescue me, he boasts. Not in himself, but in the steadfast faithfulness and grace of God. And he will bring me safely into his heavenly kingdom. Just before this passage, he writes to Timothy, Henceforth there is laid up for me a crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will award me on that day. And not to me only, but to all who loved his appearing. Here is a man confident in his Lord, sure and steadfast in the promises of the gospel, fully convinced that they are all yes and amen in Jesus Christ. He is certain of the reality of saving grace, and he is ready to be poured out, used up, and put to death. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ, he wrote the Romans? Shall tribulation, or distress, or persecution, or famine, or nakedness, or danger, or sword? As it is written, for your sake, we are being killed all the day long. We are regarded as sheep to be slaughtered. Knowing all these things, we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. For I am sure that neither death nor life, nor angels nor rulers, nor things present nor things to come, nor powers nor height nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us. From the love of God in Christ Jesus, our Lord. Paul probably wrote this somewhere late in what we think of as his third missionary journey. And he has just put it to the test and proved it once more before Caesar's court. And he's living it. Living it to the fullest and knowing ever more deeply in his own soul the truth of it. So it is. And so it shall ever be. And Paul knew it in his soul and lived it to the very end as he entered into the likeness of Christ in his death, in his crucifixion, that he might attain to the resurrection. May we know it too. 
May that be a blessing that God is bringing to his church in this age, in the places where we live and where most of us have come from and where most of us serve. I do not presume we all do know this. That we all know Christ in this way, that we all walk with Christ, that we have this confidence in Christ. But I pray we all may, that there may be no Judas among us who will sell him out for 30 pieces of silver, but that each one of us here may prove to be a faithful witness in our days. Days that may well find us hauled before judges, Days that may find us abandoned by those we counted as friends and even colleagues in the ministry. Days that may contain new and creative kinds of suffering to be endured. Days that will certainly include many temptations to balk, to pull back, to falter. May the grace of God be with us all. All who loved his appearing and establish you and uphold you that Christ may be fully proclaimed through you in all of those days, whatever they may contain, that you might be a faithful witness at all times, in all seasons, all the days that he's given and appointed to us. Amen. Let's pray. Lord, our God, we thank you that you do not leave us to ourselves, for we would falter. We would stumble and never rise again. We would find ourselves burst open in a field. But you are faithful. You know your own. You uphold your own. You preserve your own. You empower your own. You enable your own. You work through your own to do great and wonderful things. Even everything that you as the risen and ascended Lord are doing on earth for the days that it endures. Give us a faith that endures. A faith that bears up under suffering. A faith that overcomes because it is in the one who has overcome the world. We ask this in Christ's name and to the praise of his glory. Amen. Thank you for listening to All of Life for God by Reformation Heritage Books. If you have enjoyed this episode and would like to hear more, please consider subscribing and sharing with a friend. Reformation Heritage Books is a nonprofit ministry aiming to strengthen the church through Reformed, Puritan, and experiential literature. To learn more about this ministry and how to support us, please visit rhb.org.